Step four, waveguides. We have seen that uh, if we consider uh, light traveling from a dielectric in, uh, and interacting with a metal, the boundary conditions change quite dramatically. In this step, we will consider waveguides, in particular metal waveguides. Our previous discussion about Fresnel equations and light traveling from one dielectric into another can be applied to uh, fibers, in particular optical fibers. But our new boundary conditions for metals must result in different behavior in metallic waveguides. So see, let's see what those are. The scenario that we are considering is the following. We've got two very large metal plates that are in parallel. They are separated by uh, some distance A. We could also consider a closed uh, uh, metal wa uh, waveguides where we introduce some metal uh, walls over here, and then also this separation would play a role. But that would slightly complicate the mathematics without revealing any new physics. So we're going to consider only very large metal waveguides constrained only in one direction. And we feed some electromagnetic radiation between the plates, and we know, we have seen, that uh, electromagnetic waves reflect off metal surfaces. In other words, these electromagnetic waves will not escape through the surface outside of the waveguide, it will be confined to travel inside the waveguide. And the main questions that we are interested in is how does this electromagnetic wave propagate, and in particular, what's the speed of propagation, and what aspects of our waveguide or the wave affect the speed of propagation. So, let's see. Here's a top-down view of our waveguide. The plates are oriented uh, in this direction. This is ver the vertical axis uh, is labeled by Z, and the horizontal axis is labeled by X. And we're going to set up our uh, origin system to be X equals zero on this side uh, of the waveguide, and this side is X equals A. And as our wave comes in, it comes with some K vector. And this vector will have a z component and an x component. We are not going to consider a, a, a y component as well, we just assume that it's equal to zero. So, our wave is not constrained in the z direction, meaning it's just a traveling wave in the z direction. However, by using the boundary conditions that we derived in the previous step, we know that in the x direction, the field must vanish at points x equals 0 and x equals a. In other words, we must have a standing wave in the x direction. How do we describe such a wave? We know that already. It's given by the following uh, electric field. We've got some amplitude in the y direction, and we've got our traveling wave in the z direction, and we've got our standing wave in the x direction. I remind you, that k vector is given by these components, kx, ky is zero, and kz. And the magnitude of the k vector is related to the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation. So, we said that kz is unconstrained. The wave can just travel because there are no boundary conditions imposed onto the wave. But, in the x direction, we said that we must have a standing wave, meaning that kx must be an integer multiple of pi over 2. Why pi over 2? Because we require that the electric field must vanish at x equals 0, which is automatically true, and also x equals a, which is only true when kx is given by this expression. So, how does this affect the speed of the wave, prop wave propagation? So far it's not quite clear, but in the next slide we will demonstrate that it affects the speed of propagation quite drastically. So, we have the speed c of our propagation given by omega divided by the magnitude of the k vector. I haven't really mentioned anything specific about the, what's inside uh, the waveguide, is it some dielectric or not, but to keep things simple, we're just going to assume that it's air or vacuum, in other words, the refractive index is 1. And the square of the k vector is given by kx squared plus kz squared from simple Pythagoras. So we can rearrange our expression and obtain the following. Omega, the angular frequency of the wave, must be c times the modulus of our k vector. 
And we have seen that kx is not just any value, and in fact is constrained to be an integer multiple of pi over 2. So substituting that in, we obtain the following. Now let's have a close look at this expression. We see that c is a constant, so we cannot change that. a is a constant in this scenario. We fix the length uh, between the separation between the two plates. In other words, we fix the dimension of the waveguide. Pi is also a constant, and n is some constant. It really just labels which harmonic are we talking about. So the only things that can change in our expression is the angular frequency omega and the kz component of the k vector. Now let's see what happens if we decrease the angular frequency. In other words, we try to feed in a different electromagnetic radiation of la larger wavelength. So if this keeps decreasing, then in order for this expression to be satisfied, the only thing that can compensate for a decrease in omega is a decrease in kz. But we know that kz is related to the speed of propagation of the wave in the z direction, in other words, along the waveguide. So if we consider uh, larger and larger wavelengths, or smaller and smaller uh, angular frequency, this will affect the speed of propagation. And in fact, it, because kz must decrease, it will decrease the speed of propagation along the waveguide. Quite interesting. That means that there must be some minimum frequency of propagating of the electromagnetic wave through the metallic waveguide. How do we find it? It's very simple we consider at what point do we obtain uh, finite omega where kz is equal to zero. In other words, the wave stops propagating. That can be very easily solved. When kz is equal to zero, we obtain an expression for omega min. And it's simply c times pi over a, where we set n to be equal to one, because that will give us the smallest uh, angular frequency. This is very, very important. It tells us that we cannot just feed in an arbitrary electromagnetic wave into an arbitrary waveguide. The frequency of the wave that can propagate through a waveguide is closely related to the dimension of the waveguide. For example, let's consider a microwave radiation. Um, the frequency of such radiation is around 1 gigahertz, so 10 to the 9 hertz, meaning that the wavelength of such a radiation is 0.3 meters. So, if we want such a wave to propagate through the waveguide, we must be able to fit um, at least half a wavelength of radiation in the direction that's perpendicular to the plates to set up a standing wave. In our, in our case, it was the x direction, meaning that the separation between the plates must be at least half of that, in other words, must be at least 15 centimeters. This is the minimum dimension of the waveguide for this particular uh, frequency of radiation. Now this con concludes our basic discussion of the, of the waveguides. Let's see how the speed varies in a graph. Let's consider the following uh, set of axes. The horizontal axis is our uh, z component of the k vector, kz. We said that that's related to how fast the speed can propagate. High kz means high speed of propagation. And on the vertical we've got our angular frequency omega. This dashed red line is uh, for the case of an unconstrained wave. In other words, a, wa a plane wave traveling in free space. And we know that for such a case, the speed of propagation is c, which is the gradient of the light, because omega divided by kz is equal to c. Now, let's consider the case of a waveguide. The scenario changes quite a bit. For high kz and high omega, it's very similar to the unconstrained traveling wave. But for low frequencies, we see that we have the following, following crossover point uh, at the uh, omega axis, given by c pi divided by a. At that point, we, uh, if the frequency of the wave is given by this expression, then kz is equal to zero. In other words, the wave does not propagate. So this is for the fundamental frequency of our, um, of our mm, wave. What happens if we consider higher n, n equals 2, n equals 3, so the first fundamental, uh, the first harmonic, the second harmonic, and so on? Well, the minimum uh, omega will shift higher and higher and higher. 
This is because we are trying to fit more and more wavelengths uh, or more and more integer multiples of pi over 2 into our waveguide. So in order to satisfy the boundary conditions that E equals 0 at the plates, at the metal plates, we obtain higher and higher minimum angular uh, frequency. So this concludes our discussion of how electromagnetic waves propagate through metal waveguides, how they propagate in dielectrics. It also is the final lesson on classical um, electrodynamics. In the next lesson, we will start to consider limitations and uh, um, uh, how these limitations can be explained using the idea of photons. In other words, we are getting closer and closer to considering light to be uh, a quantum.